Spring, most of the networks shut down. Arthur Scargill challenges the government on pit closures. Israel tightens its grip on the Palestinians in Beirut. And Italy, the surprise World Cup semi-finalists. And England, the hopeful. Good evening. On the second day of the Aslef strike, British Rail managed to get a few more trains running than yesterday. But the service was very patchy in most areas and non-existent in others. British Rail claim 550 drivers turned up for work and they say half of these were rebel Aslef members. But the union doesn't accept these figures. BR also say that 1,250 trains ran throughout the country, compared with between 15 and 17,000 on a normal Monday. The Railways Board hope more drivers will report for work tomorrow, but they say that if the strike continues much longer, they'll have to consider whether they can afford to pay the wages of their other staff. The rail network may have looked almost deserted today, but British Rail have managed to maintain Apache service mainly on local routes. As on last Monday, many commuters tried to beat the strike by driving to work. But in London, the traffic wasn't as heavy as expected, partly because the capital's buses and tube trains were running normally. And with thousands of travellers switching to the underground, there were long delays at some stations. But many commuters did manage to complete their journeys by train, and about half the drivers who reported for work today were Aslef men, angry over their union's decision to strike and determined to keep some trains running. The public are entitled to a service, they want to get to work, and that's all I'm interested in there. Do you think other drivers will now follow your example? I don't know, I can't say. I intended to come in if I was the only person at my depot that came in. On most suburban lines in the southeast, British Rail were able to run a skeleton service thanks to the Aslef rebels and some NUR drivers. But for many passengers hoping for an easy journey home tonight, there was a lengthy wait on a crowded station. And with so few trains running, it was a case of find yourself a space and try to squeeze into it. British Rail hope to provide more trains tomorrow, but it all depends on the number of drivers who turn up for work and passengers are being advised to check with their local station before leaving home. In the Midlands, British Rail has managed to run some trains, but the service has been extremely limited, with only 15 of the 1,500 drivers reporting for work. In the west of the region, four local services have been running half-hourly, but at Wolverhampton, where many of the region's electric locomotives are stabled, there was no sign of movement. Only one intercity train has run from the West Midlands all day, at one o'clock from Birmingham to Bristol. At New Street Station in Birmingham, pickets have been on duty all day, but they say there'll be no victimization of drivers who are working. I don't think any of my colleagues bears any personal animosity towards the people that have come into work today. We feel that uh, they, they have their decision and, uh, and they've made it and, uh, and it's up to them. In the East Midlands, the strike has completely paralysed Britain's biggest freight depot at Toton in Nottinghamshire. Passenger services are severely restricted. Only one local service has been running, but British Rail has managed to operate six intercity trains to London, three from Leicester, two from Derby and one from Nottingham. So, across the country, a pretty thin service. But better than yesterday, and the Railways Board is encouraged to think that more Aslef drivers will book on tomorrow. But you get a different picture of the extent of the strike breaking from Aslef itself, based on the reports from its local officials. I put it to Ray Buckton, how many of your members turned up for duty? Quite frankly, we're not surprised that some have turned up with the attack that's been made on them and the scare tactics that's been adopted against some of our people. But quite frankly, we've been amazed by the tremendous solidarity a mere handful of people have gone to work from this union. A handful? A mere handful of people have gone to work from this union. The numbers we have are very small. Fewer than 20, according to one Aslef official. Well, British Rail said tonight that Aslef was quite deliberately underplaying the situation. Management hadn't expected a massive revolt against the strike in the early days, but they detected a groundswell of concern among the union's members, in sharp contrast to previous Aslef stoppages. As for BR, what it can't do indefinitely is to go on running a very small and totally uneconomic service 
and paying all those in the other two unions, the NUR and the White Collar Union, who are reporting for work normally. They'll be paid this week, but within the next day or two, it seems the board must decide whether to suspend the guaranteed week, laying off staff without pay. That is one option that has to be considered, but I do stress that the board hasn't taken decisions on that yet. The board at the moment is trying to persuade the footplate staff to come to work and run a railway. When will the board take that decision? Oh, we shall look at the situation as it emerges. Depends entirely on how the situation goes in the next few days. And might you, before long, take the step of telling the strikers that, uh, by reason of striking, they are deemed to have dismissed themselves? Well, again, let's look at the positive side of things. What we're trying to do is to persuade them to come to work, to reach agreements and work properly. Uh, obviously, we don't want to talk in terms of dismissal, anything of that nature. But you were thinking of those but terms. Obviously, any responsible management must look at all the options open to it. It cannot go on indefinitely, uh, taking no form of action. That's one of the uh, options that we have to consider. As for government, it will decide, probably tomorrow, whether BR should still be paid its public service obligation grant of £2 million a day for running the loss-making passenger network when it isn't doing just that. And with BR forecasting a trading loss of £165 million for this year, before the NUR and ASLEF strikes, the board's financial position is getting worse and worse. The miners' new president, Mr Arthur Scargill, has opened this year's union conference in Inverness with a forceful attack on pit closures. Mr Scargill said deliberate political decisions had been taken to destroy the industry's jobs. The NUM, he said, must not allow any more colliery closures unless pits were completely exhausted. Mr Scargill said this was the union's central task. From Inverness, our Labour Relations correspondent Martin Aidney reports. It's the union's 38th annual conference and Arthur Scargill's first as president. After three months in office, the union's now in a battle over pit closures and he's led a walkout at the coal board over an alleged closure list, something he defended today. I welcome the executive decision to walk out and I would urge an end to all forms of consultation until this information is forthcoming to our membership who have a right to expect it. In view of the board's attitude, our union at this conference must reaffirm its determination to oppose all pit closures and take industrial action to snafe slow down colliery, which we see as symptomatic of the board's attempt to introduce a closure programme in every area of the British coalfield. Protection of this industry is my first priority because without jobs, all our other claims lack substance. Warm support and also backing for his idea of moving the union's London office out to the coal fields. London is a prostituting place. It is not in a coal field. Its working class is difficult to locate. It is full of undermining influences. From the media, the hostile politicians, an NCB. The only safeguard or a safe way that we have from protecting our officials from its influence is by moving them. I do not for a minute think that Arthur will lose his way, but we have had too many casualties to take risks. Well, Mr Scargill was no doubt pleased with that concern for his welfare. He also wanted this move, he spoke for it, and the headquarters could well end up in his native Yorkshire. He's had a good day. The conference also voted to take the first steps towards merging some smaller areas. If that were to happen, it would strengthen his hold on the executive. And behind the scenes, a resolution has been agreed for tomorrow's pay debate, which calls for a minimum for the industry of £115 a week. That's an increase of about 30%, and it seems sure to be passed. The Prime Minister had another meeting with the opposition leader today and it seems they've reached a compromise over the Falklands inquiry. According to government sources, Mrs Thatcher and Mr Foote have agreed on the procedure and terms of reference. Here's Noel Lewis. 
Mrs. Thatcher's had her problems with the setting up of this inquiry. The Prime Minister wanted it established without delay, but because of the lengthy consultations with the opposition parties, it's taken longer than expected. There have been arguments about the membership, arguments about who should be chairman, and arguments about how far back the inquiry team should go. But at today's meeting with Mr. Foote, the difficulties appear to have been sorted out. Clearly, there's been a compromise. The membership of the inquiry will now be five, possibly six, representing the political parties. And it seems likely that the emphasis will be on the few months before the Falklands invasion, although covering as well the longer period of other governments since 1965. Now that the terms of reference have been agreed with Mr. Foote, the other party leaders have already been consulted, the remaining formality is for the ex-Prime Ministers to be notified. I understand letters to Mr. Edward Heath, Mr. James Callaghan and Sir Harold Wilson will be on their way very soon. If there are no further delays and distractions for Mrs. Thatcher, the details of the inquiry will be announced in the Commons on Thursday, perhaps even earlier. The intention is that the report from the senior Privy Councillors should be completed within months. In Lebanon, there have been more sporadic artillery duels on the southern outskirts of West Beirut, where the invading Israelis are besieging several thousand Palestinians. The shelling seemed to be getting worse as the Israeli army tightened its grip. The PLO replied with rockets and mortars. There's still technically a ceasefire in force, while American Special Envoy Philip Habib works for a political solution. The sticking point may be Israel's refusal to let the PLO remain in Lebanon in any form. From the Israeli side of the Beirut firing line, Keith Graves reports. The talk is of the ceasefire still holding, just. The reality is very different. The shelling started again sporadically. The Israeli gunners picking on individual targets, more to deny the PLO men cover and vantage points than anything. But at dawn today, they got down to it in earnest, and by mid-morning, West Beirut was covered by a pall of smoke, the result of concerted Israeli fire from the surrounding hills. Palestinian camps just beyond the airport were the main target. Here, the PLO has dug in its few remaining Katusha rockets and mortars amongst the tightly packed Palestinian civilians. Casualties amongst these people were inevitable. Each time an Israeli spotter pinpointed Palestinian fire, the location was peppered. Up to a dozen of the big guns, 150 and 175 millimeters, being zeroed in simultaneously on the same distant target. While this was going on, the diplomacy was continuing around the world to try and stop it. And Lebanese Prime Minister Wazan was saying that unless the siege was lifted, he for one would call off the talking, which given what was happening, didn't seem very relevant. Mr. Azan's threat appears to be having little effect. Throughout the seven years of the civil war in Beirut, even during the fiercest fighting, the crossing points between the Muslim West and the Christian East were almost invariably kept open. Now they're all closed. The siege of Beirut is complete. Only one crossing point, Beirut Museum, were odd vehicles being allowed through, and they were thoroughly searched by Israeli and Lebanese Christian soldiers. Food and even odd bottles of water were being confiscated. We were told the PLO were mining their side of the crossing about 200 yards up the road, effectively stopping people leaving. One thing is clear, the Israelis mean it when they say that only the defeat or departure of the PLO will break their siege. The British Foreign Secretary, Francis Pym, has severely criticised Israel's invasion of Lebanon. Mr Pym, who's visiting Belgrade for talks with Yugoslav leaders, said nothing would justify the invasion. Only a lasting peace would reconcile the rights of Israel and the Palestinians. The Pope has been discussing his proposed visit to Poland with the Polish primate Archbishop Józef Glemp. Archbishop Glemp arrived in Rome today to brief, to brief the Pope on the obstacles he faces in reaching agreement with the military government on the terms of the visit. It would be his first to his native country for three years. Tim Sebastian reports. Despite all the smiles, the Archbishop has brought with him a political dilemma that could have far-reaching consequences. Should the Pope visit Poland, still clamped under martial law, or should he stay at home and disappoint millions? If the Church gets it wrong, it stands to lose enormous prestige. The Archbishop said only he hoped the trip would take place. He went off to the Vatican, taking his optimism with him. 
It's understood that the Pope himself still intends to visit Poland, but he wants to use the trip as a lever. He's looking for the release of large numbers of detainees and the lifting of some of the tighter regulations. Not that the church has much to bargain with. Its demands have met with little response from the state over the last six months. Warsaw may now want a papal visit for propaganda purposes, but it won't be anxious to see a repetition of the scenes which greeted the Pope's visit to Poland three years ago. That was in itself a revolution and may have created the climate for solidarity. If the Pope comes back, the crowds will be on the streets again in their millions, only this time with union banners. The police will be powerless to break them up. Small wonder that an insecure and unpopular Communist Party has anxieties about such public adoration. At the moment, the church is the only non-communist organization allowed to function in Poland, and it's had warnings to stay in line. Archbishop Glemp has heeded them. He's said to be obsessed by the fear of civil war. Like the state authorities, though, he's been unable to prevent outbreaks of violence. It's impossible to estimate the strength of public resistance to martial law. The riots in Warsaw two months ago were the worst illustrations of opposition. But the Poles have a memory for violence, and they show no sign of forgiving the state. Despite calls from the underground for calm, the summer will bring more emotional anniversaries and much more potential for instability. For their part, the authorities have said they welcome a papal visit in principle, but that hasn't prevented weeks of haggling over details with worries on both sides. The Communist Party would like to show the country is calm and that the Pope can visit freely. All the same, they can't be sure what he'll say when he arrives or how the people will react, and large in their considerations will be the warnings from the Kremlin, which doesn't want to see the revolution begin again. Police in North Yorkshire have given more details about the last hours of the gunman Barry Prudham. He was shot dead in Moulton yesterday after spending 17 days on the run. But Prudham, who held hostage an elderly couple and their son, apparently realised he'd had little chance of escape. According to the couple, he spent much of Saturday evening watching television news broadcasts and he was amused by the stories about him. When Prudhomme was shot early yesterday, police found 50 rounds of ammunition on him, along with several knives and a machete. But just why Prudhomme became a triple killer, the police say they may never know. From Moulton, Nicholas Witchell reports. The hunt over, people in Moulton have been returning to a normal life after a week when many have locked themselves in their homes and social engagements have been cancelled. The police still have little idea where Prudhomme hid during the past week, all they know for certain is that early yesterday he left the home of Mr and Mrs Morris Johnston and hobbled to his final hiding place by this wall. The Johnstons, who are both in their 70s, are still resting after their ordeal, though it appears Prudham treated them decently. Um, after he, he realised that uh, they posed no threat to him, he uh, had quite a good relationship with them and certainly had long conversations with them. From the conversations that you know he had with them, what would you say was his mental state and indeed what was also his physical state? I think physically and mentally he was uh, exhausted. Certainly he was in a bad uh, physical state. Today the remnants of the rough hide Prudhomme tried to build around him were lying to one side. In the wall the bullet strike marks testifying to an end to the search which for days had seemed inevitable. Tonight in Madrid, England's World Cup footballers are playing the country's most important match for 12 years. They have to beat Spain by two goals to nil to qualify for the semi-finals. Barry Davis is the commentator, England, in the white shirts. Sarah's throw. And just wide by Alonso. Santum. Ricks. Needs to make it count, Ricks, and he doesn't always do so. Sansom. Robson, who nearly always does. Francis thinks about the crack, and it was a good one. Mills. Robson. Hope again. That's a good try and another good save. Is this to be the night when Arcanada finds his form? Santiana coming in from the right. Alonso has gone forward, number four. And here's Alonso! With 25 minutes to go, the score is still nil-nil. 
Before the match, there was trouble in the streets of Madrid when the Spanish police decided to break up a group of English supporters who'd gathered in a local bar. David Cass has just sent us this report. The police had warned that they would deal harshly with any trouble between the fans at this match. By trouble, it seems they meant the singing before the match in the bar most frequented by the English fans. Towards the end of the beating, the police were being egged on by Spanish chanting Argentina, Argentina. Down the street, the anti-British feeling which has been simmering here came to the surface in reply to British goading from the safety of the Bernabeu Stadium. A few England supporters outside finally drifted to another bar to compare wounds. All those we met said that at the time of the baton charge there had been no trouble even with Spanish fans. This afternoon in Barcelona, Italy clinched a semi-final place with a, a surprising but deserved victory over the favourites Brazil. John Motson describes the goals, Italy in the dark shirts. Graziani's pulled away towards the penalty spot. Coming up on this side, Antonio Cabrini from left back. Chipping it in, and a possibility for... Oh, Rossi! Rossi's got it! And here's... Socrates pushing the ball forward to Zika. Oh, what a turn. He threw Gentile. Socrates is in here. It's, oh, it's there. Socrates. Serizo. Oh, Rossi. And Rossi's in again. 2-1. Paolo Rossi. Falcao over to the right in a good position. Still Falcao out. Still Falcao. What is right? But Gomi is up there, shot by Tardelli, and it's been turned in! Paolo Rossi was there again! The match was a personal triumph for Paolo Rossi, the player who'd been banned for two years following a bribery scandal. Now Italy must beat Poland to reach the final. In Hong Kong, they've been holding the annual Dragon Boat Race, the colony's equivalent of Henley Regatta. And for the first time in the history of international dragon racing, an official British team took part. From Hong Kong, our Far East correspondent, Jim Bidolf. The British team, complete with Sue Brown, who coxed the Oxford Boat Race crew, only arrived one day before the festival to be confronted by a boat totally different from anything they'd ever tried to propel before. Local fishermen had to give them a few tips on how to paddle. The biggest problem was that the British crew were simply too heavy, so in the actual races they could only squeeze about a dozen and a half men into the boat instead of the usual 25. Sue Brown had to learn a drastically new technique as well, beating the drum to keep the paddlers in time. And then there was the weather. It poured. Not that that made much difference to the people in the boats. They'd have been soaking wet anyway. In the main race, the British team were last of six, but only just behind Australia and Japan, who'd been training for months. Incidentally, Hong Kong won by a dragon's whisker from Singapore. And the main points again. On the second day of the rail strike, there have been a few more trains, mostly on local lines, and the rail network was all but closed. The miners' president, Arthur Scargill, has challenged the government on pit closures. That's all from me for now. Good night.
Good evening. Well, there will be a few uh, scattered outbreaks of rain around tonight, mainly from this rather weak front as it moves west to east across the country. It should be clearing eastern parts around about tomorrow morning and then we'll get the ridge coming across and that means a good deal of dry weather. But as you can see, there is a depression on the tail end of that ridge and that's going to be heading towards Iceland in the meantime. Eventually, those fronts coming across, affecting northern and some western parts of the country tomorrow night and during Wednesday bringing some rain, but generally southern parts remaining dry. Let's have a look at this afternoon's satellite picture then. And this was taken at about 3 o'clock this afternoon. As you can see, there's some patchy cloud over the country there. This is the depression that's come into Ireland. It's across the Irish Sea at the moment, but as it moves eastwards across the country at the whole time, it is petering out. So that by tomorrow, well, I don't think there's going to be much rain left about in eastern parts of the country, but there might be the odd spot around in the morning and a bit on the cloudy side. But uh, all that um, getting away eastwards, the brighter weather spreading across from the west, and then a mainly dry day throughout the country with some sunshine, a few scattered showers about over Scotland initially but even those dying out and it will be a little bit warmer than today 22 centigrade that's 72 Fahrenheit that's it Tuesday evening entertainment on BBC One at 7.20 in the wonderful world of Disney a huge balloon comes to the rescue of Chester the lumber horse at five past eight, the first part of Private Shorts, Jack Pullman's highly acclaimed comedy serial starring Ian Richardson and Michael Elphick. May I make a suggestion, sir? <laughs> well? That we ask Dr Goebbels to put out a statement over the radio to London thanking the British for their contribution to the German war effort and that we've swept up their leaflets, repulp them and turned them into toilet rolls. At 9.25, John Paul's people... Following the Pope's recent visit to Britain, Gerald Priestland investigates what, if anything, makes Britain's five million Catholics different from their compatriots. What do we think we know of these, our fellow citizens, who happen also to be Catholics? Bride's head. Dogmas. Priests in long skirts and I think of the Pope. Just a glimpse of Tuesday evening's programmes on BBC One. Now, the Monday film. Walter Matthau stars with the Oscar-winning George Burns in this Neil Simon screenplay about the veteran vaudeville comedians, The Sunshine Boys. 